Good morning Good and morning. welcome to Church Online with Harrogate Vineyard. We are Maggie and Nick and we have the privilege of leading the church together. But it's you guys, our wonderful church community that make it what it is. We are so thankful for the people that are still connecting with us online, with our Sunday services, our midweek small groups and with all the other events. And we just wanted to say you've done such a wonderful job of adapting to how you do community. Yeah, you really have. And we really love hearing the stories of how you're connecting with one another and taking time to pray for each other, to help out and to meet each other's needs as best as you can. And we wanted to let you know about a few events over the next couple of weeks. Now, firstly, tomorrow night at 8 p.m. we have our monthly prayer meeting called DIG, mm -hmm. where we pray together over Zoom for our church, for our neighbours, for our town. And it's really good to see so many of you have signed up already. Smashing, yes. And uh, also we have the Vineyard National Gathering. That's going to be online for everybody to watch free over YouTube. That's on Wednesday the 27th to Friday the 29th of January and they're going to have speakers including Joe Saxton, John and Debbie Wright, Alexander Fenter and Pete Grigg as well. And um, There is more info on that on the website so do check that out. Yep and this Thursday we have our next online youth Zoom meetup. Um, I'll send out the Zoom link shortly to the parents and finally we wanted to share a quick interview we recorded with Joy and Ian Reavy to introduce next Sunday's upcoming event. Yes. So, back by popular demand, we have the HVC quiz coming up. Ian and Joy, would you like to tell us more? Sure, we're going to have a quiz. Yay! And it's going to be questions. Yep, we're going to ask them and you're going to answer them. And we're going to mix it up a bit this time. Okay. Yep. And we're going, to, we're going to do it in honour of the famous and fabulous Scottish poet, Robert Burns. <laughs> yes, of course. Oh. Yes, yes, we are. A Burns Night quiz for you all. Wonderful. Sounds fabulous. So when's it going to be? It's going to be Sunday the 24th at 7 o'clock. Brilliant. Smashing. Sunday the 24th, 7 o'clock. So it's going to be a quiz, but there's going to be a few different little quirky things going on in there just to make it a little bit different for lockdown three. Ooh. Amazing. Really looking forward to that. Thank you so much. I cannot wait, to be honest. Do I have to read poetry this year? You do. Ach, I the new. <laughs> we sleek it, corn, timorous beastie. Oh, what a pancake is in thy breastie. Okay, lovely. Right. Lovely. No idea what that means. Brilliant. Smashing. Really Thank you so much. We're looking forward to that. And we'll make sure that um, you can sign up on the website. Yep. And you can sign up through Church Suite as well. So please Excellent. do join us. It will be great fun. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jean. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. That's going to be great. And we're signed up and looking forward to it. Now, just before I hand over to Nick to lead us in worship this morning, I just want to share the outtake from that interview. Before we started recording this clip, we'd been joking that Nick cannot start sentences without clapping his hands together. And so this was after he'd been saying to himself, don't clap your hands, I must not clap my hands. So I really want you to see it because I find it really funny. Sorry. <laughs> so back by popular demand. <laughs> I did clap, you're right. I did. <laughs> Stop, stop recording. Oh, thank you, Maggie. Always happy to look foolish for your entertainment. Do you know, I'm, I'm going to have to sit on my hands from now on whenever we're actually doing any recording at all. I think so. um, well, I think that's a suitably holy moment to head into worship from there. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Um, OK, so we would love you to join us this morning as we um, sing three simple songs 
to express our praise, our trust and our surrender to the Most High God. So let's pray. Come Holy Spirit, let your presence draw near to each one of us as we come with honest and with open hearts before you. Draw near to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, fall on your grave. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered
have led me through the fire and darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh my life, you have been. Where can I go from your presence? 
Thank you for worshipping with us this morning. Now we're going to pass over to Steve Stapp, who is going to be preaching on the next instalment of our journey through the letter of James. Over to you, Steve. Good morning. I hope you are well. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve, and I am the assistant pastor here at Harrogate Vineyard Church. Let's take a minute to pray as we start. Father God, we praise you, we thank you, and we desire, Lord, that you would lead us this morning. We desire, Lord, that you would express your words for us to hear and that you would enable us, God, to have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand what you're saying to us, a heart to obey you, to be followers of Jesus, true disciples. Thank you, Lord. Please help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as most of you know, we have been looking at the book of James in the New Testament for a while now and have uncovered some wonderful truths there, wisdom to help us live life and to follow Jesus well. You may remember that this New Testament book we call James was a letter written uh, to scattered Christians by the half-brother of Jesus, uh, whose name was James. Most of the believers that James was writing to were facing difficult lives. They were trying to survive persecution and injustice. The middle of the first century was a time when Christians were often treated unfairly and even harshly. James' desire uh, was for those first century followers of Jesus and his desire for us today is to see and respond to hard times from God's perspective so that we can learn patience, perseverance, strength, learn to be true followers of Jesus, disciples willing to show with our lives that our faith is genuine. Today we're going to take a look at the fifth chapter of James, the last chapter of James. Specifically, we'll be looking at verses 7 through 12. So let's start by reading these verses together. I'll be reading from the NIV. Be patient, then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. 
See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of James Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. James starts this section of his letter with these simple words. Be patient. How do you feel about the topic of being patient? When I realized that I would be speaking on the topic of patience today, I laughed. I don't know if you think God has a sense of humor, but I think he does, or at least he has a great sense of irony. Because when I think about patience, I think about the list of the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. The one I'm most tempted to leave out of that list is actually patience, because patience does not come easily for me. When I was about five years old, my mother, who had a degree in music, started teaching me to play the piano. I was the youngest of four kids in our family, and she had also started teaching each of my older siblings to play the piano at a similar age. Interestingly enough, though, she was actually successful with the other three. <laughs> All of them turned out to be excellent musicians. In fact, they each pursued a university degree in music. Not me. I think the older three must have had a bit more patience than I did because I really hated sitting still on that piano bench long enough to practice the way I was supposed to. I wanted to be outside running around and playing games. Well, what is patience anyway? How would you define patience? Here's a definition from a pastor named Mark Ballinger. Patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate, delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Well, oh boy. Well, we see patience expressed in different ways. There's a story, a bit of a cheeky story, about a lady who was working in a shop on the upper floor of a big shopping center. Just outside her shop, there was a spot where the escalator came up from the floor below. One day she noticed a boy who had been standing at the top of the escalator for a minute or two, just standing there, being patient. So she walked over and asked him if he was lost. He said, Oh no, ma'am. I'm just waiting for my chewing gum to come back around. Okay, I'm not sure if I would want that chewing gum when it came back around on the escalator, but that little boy was being patient. There are two different Greek words used in the New Testament for patience. One of them carries the idea of being able to hold your temper for a long time, choosing not to lose your temper with someone. An example might be a parent dealing with an unhappy child who's throwing a fit. That parent may choose to hold their temper and respond with patience and graciousness rather than yelling and responding with anger. That parent might be patient, might be, on the other hand, tempted to tell that child that they are grounded until the second coming of Jesus and maybe longer. But hopefully they're patient and they choose uh, to be gracious instead. Now the other word for patience in the New Testament is the idea of remaining under, like remaining under a burden, carrying the weight of difficult circumstances for an extended period. A similar word in the Bible might be long-suffering. It's the idea of remaining faithful when facing difficult or stressful circumstances that go on for a period of time. This is the kind of patience that James is talking about in our verses today. 
the kind of patience that involves being steady and faithful when dealing with stressful circumstances that go on for a while. James gives us some examples of this kind of patience or long-suffering. He starts with a very common example that all his readers would be familiar with, the simple example of farmers waiting for their crops to grow and be ready for harvest. Now, I grew up in a farming area, and my first paying job was driving a tractor, plowing fields for local farmers. Those farmers worked hard, but no matter how hard they worked, they could never make their crops grow any faster. <laughs> and those farmers also couldn't do anything about the stress and the risk that just before harvest, a massive storm might wipe out their entire crop. James mentions a second example of patience in our passage. He points to the prophets from the Old Testament who were often ridiculed and persecuted when they delivered messages that God gave them. But God expected them to keep patiently delivering those words no matter what it cost them personally. He expected them to have the kind of patience that involved being faithful under stress. A third example in James mentions Job, who suddenly lost everything. He lost his family, his finances, and finally he lost his health. And he had done nothing to deserve that. And yet Job, in the midst of his suffering, continued to trust God. Job had deep perseverance and patience. A friend of mine has been facing a rare form of cancer for almost 10 years now. I think of him and his family as having the kind of patience that Job had. After my friend was diagnosed, there was surgery and treatment, and for a few years they thought he might be cancer-free, but then it came back. Over the last five years, he's been involved in various different medical trials and experimental treatment programs. Some of them seemed to help for a while but none have offered a permanent solution. And in addition to the cancer itself, there have been awful side effects at times, plus very difficult financial challenges. His family has been tremendous in supporting him and caring for him, but they are all worn out. And the doctors are no longer offering any hope that he can be cured. My friend and his family have shown patience and strength and faithfulness in the way they have steadily endured and carried this burden of cancer. The kind of patience expressed in that family's attitude and actions can be captured in this question. When stressful times come our way, after we've done what we can do, are we willing to patiently wait on God to accept our circumstances and still trust God? God does not promise to rescue us out of every circumstance we face in this life. Will we continue to trust Him and be faithful and patient? I've heard my wonderful wife describe a similar question that has been a battle for her at times over the years since our son died. Will I still trust God and believe that He is good? Every time you set three places at the table instead of four, Every time you get in the car and it seems like someone's missing, you ask that question, Is God good? Will I trust Him? That core question, Will I trust God? Will I be faithful and patiently wait on Him when I face stressful circumstances? That question is the heart of what James is focusing on in our passage. But there is also something else that he touches on. He touches on our words. The kind of patience we've been talking about so far has to do with our attitude and our actions. But James also talks about expressing our patience in our words. In verse 9, James tells us not to grumble. In verse 12, he says not to swear an oath, but rather to stick with a simple yes or no. This way we can express our patient faith in God, not only in our actions, but in our words as well. James calls us to be patient, to be faithful, to trust God patiently in our attitudes, our actions, and our words. 
But what does that kind of patience and trust look like in the context of our lives today in January of 2021, after almost a year of global pandemic? Well, if God does not rescue me or my loved ones from COVID-19, will I still trust him? If God does not rescue my business, my career, my education, will I still trust him? Job gave us his answer to this question of patiently trusting God in the midst of suffering. In Job 13, verse 15, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. This past year has been a difficult time for many, and we don't know what the future holds. We have no guarantees. So this is a pertinent time, an important time for each of us to ask this question. If things don't go the way I want them to, will I still patiently trust God? Will I still say that God is good? Or will I scream at God in anger, accuse him of being unfair, accuse him of being unjust? Those questions of patiently trusting God are very similar to the questions faced by James' readers. Many of them faced hardship in their finances, their careers, their businesses, their relationships. But James reminded them in verse 11 that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We do not follow and trust in and patiently wait on a God who is mean or harsh or uncaring. No, we follow and trust in and patiently wait for a God who is full of compassion and mercy, a God who loves us deeply. The Apostle John said in 1 John 3, 1, See how very, very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. James didn't promise his readers a quick fix, and he does not promise us a quick fix today. Instead, he simply said, be patient and trust God. God will do what's right, in God's way, in God's time. So that's my encouragement to you today. You have a Father in Heaven who loves you deeply. Be patient and trust Him. God is full of compassion and mercy. He will do what's right in his way, in his time. So be patient. Thank you for being with us today. May you be blessed and encouraged, and may the Lord help both you and me to be patient. We look forward to connecting with you next week, so be blessed and have a great day.